Okay, so today's video is going to cover food webs, chains, pyramids, things that hopefully will be review for most of you. Uh, so let's start with some of the vocabulary to make sure that we're all on the same page vocabulary-wise. Okay, so let's talk first about what an autotroph is. Okay, so remember auto is self, troph is nutrition. Okay, so autotrophs are self, um, they are self-feeding. They produce their own nutrition. Okay, another word for an autotroph is uh, they are sometimes called the producer of the food chain or the web. Okay, so they produce all of the food energy that's going to be used throughout the entire food web, the entire food chain. Okay, so that's where their producer status comes from. Again, they're producing the food energy that's going to be used throughout the entire food chain or food web. And so there's a couple of different kinds of producers. If y'all remember, we talked about kingdoms. Um, we talked about photosynthetic producers versus uh, chemosynthetic producers. So up top here, we have a couple of pictures of photosynthetic producers. Okay, I've got my terrestrial plant here. Okay, so that's my land producer. So on land, most of my producers are obviously going to be plants, and so they are photosynthetic. They're using that light energy and converting it into chemical food energy. Most of our aquatic producers, so over there on the right, okay, I've got my aquatic producers. Many of these are going to be what are called phytoplankton. Remember, phyt is plant. Okay, so phytoplankton are plant-like algae. Um, there are other kinds of algae that could also act as a producer in the aquatic environments, okay, but these still do photosynthesis. And then we do have some, um, some ecosystems that are, um, that are uh, done by a chemosynthetic producer. Okay, so remember chemosynthetic, those are the ones that took the chemicals, okay, like hydrogen sulfide here, and they take these chemicals and they turn them into the organic compounds that are needed. And so what we have here is another an aquatic ecosystem that has these bacteria that act as the producer. They're down at the hydrothermal vents, so down at the hot water vents, down at the hydrothermal vents. And these bacteria convert the hydrogen sulfide that's there uh, into organic compounds. And they are the basis of, they are the producers of these food chains here. Okay, so in addition to autotrophs, we also have heterotrophs. Okay, if you remember, hetero is other. And so these are, um, these are not self-feeding. Okay, they have to get their food from a different source, their nutrition from an outside source. And so we can have, remember we can have ingestion. So those would be um, organisms like us that actually eat. Okay, or we could have absorption heterotroph like fungus, bacteria that do are decomposers that digest the food, break down the food outside of the organism, and then absorb the nutrients. So a couple of examples here, right? We've got herbivores. Okay. Remember, a herbivore is going to only eat vegetation or plants. Okay. They don't eat any meat at all. Okay. Uh, down here, you've got some carnivores. Remember, carnivores are meat eaters. They only eat meat, so they don't eat any plants. And then down here at the bottom, we've got some examples of omnivores. And remember, omnivores are going to eat plants and meat. So these are what are going to round out the rest of our food chains and our food webs are these different kinds of consumers. Okay, so a heterotroph is also a consumer. Okay, and the last um, term vocabulary-wise that I want to look at real quick with our food chains and food webs is going to be a decomposer versus a detritivore. Okay, so a decomposer is going to digest. It's basically going to be, this is going to be an absorption heterotroph. So it's going to digest the organic material outside of its body, break that nutrients down and absorb them. These are things like fungus, bacteria, okay, that break down the dead plants and the dead animals and recycle the nutrients. Detritivores eat what is called detritus, 
Okay? And so detritus is dead organic matter, okay? and as well as solid waste. Okay? So it could be dead plants, dead animals, the solid waste of animals, and it will actually eat them. So it is an ingestion heterotroph. Detritivores are ingestion heterotrophs. And so you can see like the example we have over here with this compost pile. Okay, it starts with the detritus and you have all kinds of detritivores in there that are releasing the energy from that detritus to then feed the ecosystem. If we take a second and look at this cave ecosystem, you can see uh, they're showing the picture there up here on the right here of the cave snail. Uh, that's an example of something called a troglobite. Okay, and a troglobite is, that's a T. Okay, a troglobite is something that spends its entire life in the dark. Okay, so it never, these are things that are never going to leave these caves. They're going to spend their entire life in the darkness. Well, you think about if it's totally dark, then there no photosynthesis is able to happen. So your traditional photosynthetic uh, producers are not going to be able to function very well in this cave ecosystem. And what happens is these troglobites that live in there, they rely on the organic material that comes in from the bats. Okay, um, the bats aren't the only source, but it's the main source. Okay, so the the waste products of the bats, the organic material that they bring in, the, the guano there is the waste product of the bat. They, these troglobites then, will, are, they act as detritivores. And so they will eat this organic material, this detritus, and that's what's going to fuel that entire ecosystem. You can see it happening here in this eco-pyramid. Many of you remember, we have different levels of the food chains. These are what are called our trophic levels. Remember, troph means nutrition, so these are our nutrition levels. And we're talking about nutrition levels, we're referring to our chemical nutrition. And so our food, way, our food web here, a chain that I have an example of here, we're not going to start with the sun, that's not chemical nutrition. So I'm going to start with my producer, which is the grass. So that's my first trophic level, is the producer level. Our second level is going to be the primary consumers, or the herbivores. So that's actually label number one, okay? And like I said, this is our primary consumers or herbivores. So this is our first consumer in the food chain, okay? So our next level then, number two here, so it's our third trophic level, but it's only labeled number two because that first level is named P for producer. I know it gets a little, makes it a little weird. So the third trophic level there is labeled number two, and this is going to be our secondary consumers. I can't spell. So this is where you're going to see your carnivores. Uh, omnivores would be on this level because they are usually assigned the level. Uh, the highest level that they feed at. Okay. And then that fourth trophic level, okay, this one here, is going to contain our tertiary consumers. And if you remember a tertiary consumer, that is a carnivore that eats other carnivores. Like when the hawk eats the snake, okay, and the snake just ate the mouse, the hawk becomes a tertiary consumer because it's eating another carnivore. Very rarely, you may see another level with what's called a quaternary consumer. Okay, a quaternary consumer, again, is going to be very rare because very rarely is there enough energy to support that fourth level. So that would be a fourth consumer level, Again, that can be very rarely supported due to energy, and you'll see that in just a minute with the amount of energy that's passed from level to level. So if we pause just for a second and we add, um, apply what we just did to an actual food web, then we've got our P, our producer level down there. Okay, the cricket is our herbivore, right? That's my primary consumer. My mouse is both a primary consumer as well as a secondary consumer. So he would normally be labeled as a secondary consumer on that 
Um, trophic level wise, though, puts us on that third trophic level, okay, to be named the secondary consumer. Okay, a snake would be a secondary consumer. A lizard is a secondary consumer, right, because they're carnivores. An insect may not seem like meat, but they are meat eaters by eating the insect. Okay, and then the hawk is a tertiary consumer because it's a carnivore eating another carnivore. Remember, too, what your arrows represent. Okay, your arrows represent the flow of energy. Okay, and so they always point into the mouth of whatever is doing the eating. Okay, because energy is flowing from the snake into the hawk. Okay, so the arrows in our food chains and food webs represent the flow of the chemical energy. Okay, so let's take a second and look at energy flow. Okay, so only um, approximately 10% of energy is transferred to the next level. So from producer to primary consumer, 10%. 10% of the energy from the primary consumer gets transferred to the secondary consumer. The majority of it is lost as heat during digestion and chemical reactions. Most of it is going to be lost as heat during digestion. So if you look, for example, at this energy pyramid that we have here, down at the bottom with the producers, I've got 100% of the energy. Well, only 10% of that energy is transferred to the next level. Okay? So move my decimal point over one place, I get 10% of the energy is available for the primary consumers. So the primary consumers need to eat a, a decent amount of plant food to be able to sustain themselves because they only get 10% of the energy that the plants had. Well, the carnivore that is coming up next that eats the herbivore and doesn't eat any plant only gets 1% of the original energy from down here with the plants because um, each time only 10% is being passed up. Okay, so only 10% of 10 is only going to be 1. This hawk up here, this owl, it's only going to receive 0.1% of the original 100% of energy that came from the plants. This is why our tertiary consumer, it's one of the reasons why they're usually fewer in number, because they have to eat a significant amount, and if there were large amounts of them, there wouldn't be enough prey for them to be able to sustain their population. Okay, so let's look at some ecological pyramids. So we've got three basic kinds of pyramids. Okay, I've got an energy pyramid. Uh, this one over here could represent a biomass pyramid. And this one down here could represent a numbers pyramid. So an energy pyramid is going to show the relative amounts of energy available at each trophic level. Okay, so these big numbers over here would tell you what trophic level they're at. And you can see my energy is listed here, okay, and it's listed in kcals. Kcal stands for kilocalorie. That is the most common unit of energy that you would see when we're talking about ecology things. Okay. So, for instance, in this particular uh, system, the grass has 10,000 kilocalories of energy. And so the next level only gets 10% of that. So now I'm down to 1,000. I only get 10% of that. I'm at 100 kilocalories. The snake at 10. The hawk getting just one kilocalorie of that original 10,000 uh, kilocalories of energy available. So that's your energy pyramid. Your biomass pyramid is going to show relative amounts of biomass at each trophic level. And biomass is essentially just mass of the organisms. And as a general rule, the producers will have the biggest mass. And as we work our way up, the carnivores, the tertiary consumers, they have a smaller mass as a general rule. We're going to look at some exceptions in just a second. Same with a numbers pyramid. A numbers pyramid is just going to tell us how many. Okay, so how many of each organisms are at each trophic level. And as a general rule, we're going to have more producers in, in, um, than we do tertiary and secondary consumers, mainly just because they need to um, produce the energy to sustain the entire food chain. So let's look at a couple of um, exceptions to that. Occasionally, we may see a pyramid uh, that looks a little strange. A, um, it's got down at the bottom is significantly smaller. A, unlike your traditional pyramid where the base is always the biggest. And some places where we may see some um, exceptions to this would be with, um, if you think of a, let's, let's talk for a second about a biomass pyramid. Okay, so I've got a biomass pyramid, okay, and it's aquatic. 
Well, my number one producer in the aquatic ecosystem is phytoplankton. And phytoplankton is a microscopic organism. So there may be tons and tons and tons of them. Okay, so here's the, this would be your numbers pyramid for it up there, your traditional pyramid, an aquatic ecosystem. Tons and tons and tons of these microscopic organisms. We're down here on the right, this would be your biomass of an aquatic ecosystem. Even though there's millions of these organisms, they're microscopic. And so their mass is actually very small. You can also see this um, switch sometimes in a forest ecosystem, okay, where your mass is going of your producers is going to be very, very large. And so you'll have a traditional pyramid there. But your number one producer in a forest ecosystem may be very large trees. And so even though they may have a very big mass and they are very large, you may not necessarily need that many of them to maintain the ecosystem because each tree has large amounts of leaves and um, is it in it of itself is a very large producer. The last thing I want to do is just look at a couple of kind of what if questions because these are the things that you're going to be asked, you know, on your star test, on your unit test. Okay, if I do this to the food web, what would happen? Okay, so for example, let's say I increase my rabbit population. Okay, well, if I increase my rabbit population, then my hawk population would go up, right? But my grass population now is going to go down. Okay. Well, if my grass population goes down, then what happens to my grasshoppers? Okay. They may start to go down. So then I may also see a decrease in snakes. So you can see that there's a, a wide variety of things that could happen just by impacting the rabbits over here. Okay. Let's, look, let's look at another example here. Okay. So let's look at these snakes. Okay, so what happens if I decrease my snake population? Well, what would happen to the hawk if I decrease my snake population specifically? Well, if I decrease my snake population, then my, mice pop my mouse population could go up. If my mouse population goes up, then my hawk population could go up. And that's going to happen because I've decreased competition now right, between the snake and the hawk. The hawk is not competing for the food, so its population can increase because there's uh, more food available to it. Uh, let's look at a different food web with a couple more of those kinds of questions. You may also be asked to look at some cause-type questions, like what would cause the seal population to decrease? Okay, so what would cause that to decrease? Well, somewhere along the way, there could be a decrease in fish population. Okay? There could be a decrease in the seabirds. So now there's not enough food for the seals, so their population would then increase. Okay? So just a variety of application-type questions that you guys could be asked with food webs. So we'll be working with those kinds of questions in class.